Good evening. I'm Doug Schwartz, and I want to welcome you to this very special lecture, this School for Advanced Research. I see so many old friends. At, I'm sorry, what did you say? Somebody just said, is he still alive? <laughs> Our speaker tonight began as a merit scholar entering uh, West Virginia Wesleyan University. He received his BA from that university and 20 years later, by a unanimous vote of the faculty, he came back to re receive a Doctor of Humane Letters. That indicates the kind of man I'll be talking about very briefly tonight to introduce him. And David Stewart went on to receive a master's and PhD at the University of New Mexico and began doing archaeological work, a lot of archaeological field work in the Southwest as well as in Mexico, Alaska, and he's worked in Ecuador, and received a Guggenheim Fellowship. As he was doing his archaeological research, he began teaching at the university, and really undergraduate teaching became one of his many passions. He received from the university a student service award. I looked at the evaluation, student evaluations of Dave. I did my homework, Dave. And uh, one just caught my eye that said, if you are an anthropology student, you should take a course from this professor. He's a great teacher, and he has the whole history of the Southwest in his head. <laughs> Dave, uh, in addition to doing his archaeological field work and teaching, has done extensive writing. He is a prolific writer. He's written 12 books, which include both scholarly volumes and novels. One of the scholarly volumes, Anasazi America, to me illustrates just in its subtitle something of the creativity of this man. It's Anasazi America, 17 centuries on the road from center place. This has had five printings. And a review of this book in the Society for American Archaeology's journal, American Antiquity, started, this is the kind of book archaeologists should write. Wouldn't anybody like to have a review like that? Now, while Dave was doing his research, while he was teaching, and while he was writing, the university decided that they had an administrative issue that they wanted to have solved, and they identified Dave as someone who had that kind of initiative, and they asked him to uh, work on this problem. That led to him being associate provost of the university for an extended period of time. And I wish you could read his resume and the kinds of things he was involved with just in that part of his life. It looked to me like uh, whenever the university had a problem, they gave it to him to solve, and whenever they had a new idea, they gave it to him to implement. So writing, research, teaching, administration, this is a quadruple threat 
of a man. It's my pleasure to introduce the interim president of the School for Advanced Research in this very important transition that it is going through, my friend, David Stewart. Good evening, folks. Can you hear me? I'm Dave Stewart, and tonight's lecture involves the mechanics of how small farmers in the four corners in the first several centuries after the birth of Christ and their descendants eventually created what we call the Chaco phenomenon. This line of research is a bit unusual. It's a different take on the archaeological record. And it proceeds from a series of research problems that I presented to my undergraduate classes at UNM, where I involve undergraduate students in fundamental basic research. No point in waiting for grad school for that. The folks who worked with me on this, on the data that's presented tonight, as opposed to other lectures in the year, were Jenny Lund Sherman, born and raised in Albuquerque, and Christine Dubois, born and raised in Los Alamos. Jenny graduated cum laude at UNM last year, Christine summa cum laude. And I relied on them to answer questions that had never been answered in our profession. And we, in turn, the three of us, relied on many other experts around the nation, indeed a few around the world, to help us with methodological issues. Our project was called Finding the Cowries. Traditional archaeological approaches focus on change in architecture, pottery, tools, burial remains, etc and piece together pictures or portraits of change over time. Thus, in most textbooks, formal archaeological stages of development are typically described with reference to size, shape, material of domestic architecture, changing pottery styles, analysis of grave goods, basic tool types, skeletal abnormalities, etc. Now that all is a really fascinating detective game, and I've spent quite a lot of my life involved in it. But little is said or recorded of agricultural facilities, detection of clues to minor changes in daily behavior and activities, and just how those minor changes lead up to huge evolutionary trends. Imagine for a moment that tomorrow 100 million more Americans, when they walked out of a room, would actually turn out the light. It would have an impact instantly on efficiency and energy usage in American society. If 50 million Americans bought a hybrid car instead of talking about it, it would have a huge impact on our use of fossil fuels. Well, the roots of this project are more modest than something the size of modern American society. It starts at about 250 AD. And the roots of some of the data that we pulled together that allowed us to begin to know the dynamics that led to the Chacoan system centuries later, were seeded at SAR in an advanced seminar 30 years ago this coming fall. And in that seminar, a group of 
experts on the archaeology in concert with computer specialists and statistical specialists put together a database of all the known archaeological sites by time period in the northwest quadrant of the San Juan Basin. And from that body of data, we were able to have a frame of reference that told us something about the trajectory of change and the increase in the numbers of archaeological sites that we used in my classes in the Finding the Calories project. In short, traditional archaeology does sometimes present an incomplete picture in putting standard archaeological portraits together. And data, when it's compiled for research purposes, doesn't necessarily get used instantly. But it's there, and if it's done well, it's a resource for all time. So, my students and I started the Finding the Calories project, simply to make visible previously invisible parts of archaeological reality, such as the size of farms. It's not in any textbook. There's no textbook that tells you what size farm a small farmer was working in 250 A.D. or 600 A.D. or 800 A.D. The cost of a pregnancy. You can't get population growth that leads to something as large and as dramatic as the Chacoan world without fueling and paying for, in food costs, pregnancy. And how many calories were returned from an acre of traditional corn in an average year? An average year, what was an average year in precipitation? How can we know that? That brings in dendrochronology and other fields. And why focus on calories in the first place? Every one of our bodies is fueled by calories in the first place. Every structure, every built by humans anywhere, was fueled by labor, directly measurable in calories. Every great public works project has costs. Labor, the fashioning and acquisition of materials, moving dirt. In the medieval world, even as late as the 19th century, masons charged different prices for walls over chest height. It costs more to raise the second row of stone blocks in a wall than the first row, and more to raise the third row. It therefore costs more to have two or three stories on an ancient dwelling than it does to have one. The weight of the material, the height that it is transported, can be deduced and converted into calories. Every trade network has transport and logistic costs reducible to calories. And every tank of fuel you burn in your car is convertible from BTUs to calories. Every human system runs on fuel, whether it's food, or firewood, or coal, or whale oil, or peat, or atomic reaction. It runs on fuel. We are in this room tonight, rather like ancient four-corner farmers in one fundamental respect that we rarely think about. We are a self-created energy system. We call ours modern America. Our lives, like those farmers, are measurable. The length of them, our body weight, our basal metabolism, the average body temperature, 
all measurable, all knowable, all replicable. But the point in anthropology and archaeology is that different kinds of societies and lifestyles have knowable energetic profiles or signatures. Animals also have species-specific energetic and caloric profiles as radically different as rather solitary turtles on the one hand or swarms of locusts or cicadas on another. The former, the turtle, is highly efficient, lives a long time, doesn't transform morphologically, that is body shape much from the time it comes out of its shell till its death, gets larger, to a point, burrows, many of them, in the, in, in the ground part of the year, conserving calories, body temperatures low, turtles are efficient. They do not change rapidly in fossil evolution. In contrast, you have locusts and cicadas. They're born when moisture and temperature conditions are just right, transform from pupae through several body phases in short order, swarm in great numbers, leave their little skeletons on sycamore trees, the exoskeleton, eat up a lot, burn fast, run hot, and die quickly. Hunter and gather societies are efficient like turtles and so have occupied most of our species history. Great industrial societies are a bit more like locusts and are succeeded every few hundred years. Old Kingdom Egypt, 3,000. New Kingdom, 2,000. Rome, a thousand, almost on the nose. The British Empire, 450. Byzantium, also 450. Russia. What's next? Each society larger, pumps more energy through it. Its lifespan and unmodified form is shorter. And every archaeological site is a testament to two things we rarely talk about. One, the failure of a society to adapt perfectly in that place, or it wouldn't be archaeology, would it? And two, every archaeological site is the evolutionary exoskeleton of a family, a village, a town, and in groups, a society. And those changing natures of the archaeological record through time, like SAR followed in the really genuinely fabled Arroyo Hondo project, tell us that the minor differences from different time periods, this, the subtle changes in exoskeleton, are footprints of evolutionary process right in front of us. But in animals, those structural and energetic attributes of how much energy and how much morphological change are genetically determined. The changing archaeological record in the southwest from 400 A.D. to 1100 A.D. represents a much slower motion series of changes, again, similar to the changing body forms of a locust or a cicada. And we can read the morphological changes if we are careful. And when we speak of humans, and our own society, we often speak of per capita energy consumption as if it's a modern phenomenon. 
which is just not the reality. Per capita energy consumption applies to all human societies through all time. But unlike animals, our cultural behaviors, our learned cultural behaviors, shape most of our modern energy consumption. The percentage of calories that as a nation we consume in the contemporary U.S. as food is a tiny fraction of the U.S.'s overall energetic expenditures in a year. In 250 A.D. in the Four Corners District, which begins our story, cultural behavior determined just over half of all the energy consumed by ancient southwestern farmers. So energetically speaking, the most striking change in New Mexico in the last thousand years is the relative proportion of calories, the relative proportion of calories which are expended by an ordinary family in the service of cultural behavior and conveniences and habits rather than the genetically shaped ones of body size, metabolic efficiency, and body temperature. In other words, human cultural behavior statistically trumps our genetic inheritance. It allows us to adapt rapidly, change rapidly, meet new circumstances rapidly, but it requires that we understand the problems we are attempting to solve accurately. Because if we misjudge them, we maladapt more, more quickly, more rapidly, and more completely than any animal species that waits another 20 or 30 generations for the adaptive process to force change. Modern America is culturally expensive. We use twice the per capita energy as the next most expensive Western industrial democracies. They, in turn, use hundreds of times more per capita energy than did the Southwest Chacoans of the fabulous 10 and 1100s AD. The Chacoans, in turn, at their peak, about 1080, used about 10 times more annual per capita energy than did their early basket maker ancestors in the 250 to 400 AD period, 700 years before. As a general rule, the more complex a society is, the more calorically expensive it is. And in the world of cultures, simple, homogeneous, and small, is cheap. Large, complex, and heterogeneous is expensive. We're here in this room tonight are of an expensive society. So let us go back to 250 AD and let me set the archaeological setting for you. Relax. You can close your eyes for a minute if you want to. I'm going to try and draw, draw a picture. It's just pre-dawn, and you're trudging along toward a small farmstead at 250 A.D. in broken Mesa and Arroyo country, somewhere 25 to 30 miles northwest of Chaco Canyon. You can just make out the dimly outlined dugout ramp which is the entrance to a deep, oval, dirt-covered pit house of about 250 square feet in floor area. It's thermally efficient. Its ramped entrance faces east to catch the rising morning sun. You can smell the smoke from a hearth smoldering inside. A family of 11, what we call our Four Corners family for modeling purposes, which we constructed from hundreds and hundreds of photographs of Ho farming people around the world who did not yet have power tools of any kind or the plow. 
This family of 11, six adults, five children, begin to awaken about 5.15 to 5.20 a.m. to start another late April day. The average male is 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighs 110 to 115 pounds. For comparison, in your mental files, Ulysses S. Grant was about 5 foot 3 and a half and weighed 120 pounds during his service in the Mexican War. The average size of Americans has also grown. Breakfast is warm cornmeal gruel, perhaps with a bit of rabbit meat, perhaps a handful of toasted pignon, or a sliver of venison or pronghorn jerky. The family begins to scatter for the day's activities by about 6 or 6.30 a.m., some to check the reality, or excuse me, some to check the recently planted fields, the little ditch systems they dig, the runoff, walls and cobbles they build as slow water. Others care for children, grind cornmeal, hunt for rabbits and birds eggs, collect early season grass seeds, or any eggs from the family's two or three domesticated turkeys. Others carry water and collect brush for the fire, or make tools, baskets, etc. These 11 members of our Four Corners family very meticulously weighed and sized and dealt with metabolically require 21,292 calories a day to maintain body weight at a moderate activity factor. You can find these on websites all over the place. Calculate your exercise in the afternoon and how many calories it's going to burn off. Moderate activity factor of 1.55, which adjusts the basal metabolic costs. Body weight ranges from 42 pounds in this family to 112. One female, age 26, is pregnant. She's in her third trimester and has special needs for protein and an ampler diet. She may have had a half ounce of high-protein amaranth seeds to start her day, or a slightly larger piece of jerky, or perhaps even the luxury of a turkey egg. If she carries her child to term, the cost will be 81,000 additional calories on top of the daily requirement for her on an ordinary basis. That is over 1,150 cobs of prehistoric corn at 68 to 70 calories per cob. It's too early in the season for new corn or harvest of the beneficial weeds which invade those fields like goosefoot and amaranth. 13,000 of the daily calories for this family come from corn and squash or bean seeds stored the previous fall. But since a largest size cob of corn contains just under 70 calories, foraging for wild plants and small game continues to be extremely important. The nearest adjoining farmstead is about one and a half miles downstream. This is 250 AD. Also situated on a small pinyon juniper studded rise above the same rocky intermittent stream in the arroyo which connects them. Firewood is plentiful. This is a good thing as the earliest brownware pottery, its origins in southern New Mexico, will soon begin to change daily cooking practices. 40% of the diet, possibly 50% at this season, comes from a combination of stored wild grass seeds from the previous fall. Amaranth, blazing star, drop seed, tansy mustard, Indian rice grass, etc. New harvests of some early maturing wild grasses, early spring rabbit, overwintered prickly pear fruits, 
some migrating birds, prairie dogs, other rodents such as wood rats, and dried choke cherries and wolf berries are all consumed as available. It is high-grade protein, fats, and oils that are all in short supply this April. The winter was a long one, and last year's fall harvest is mostly used up. One and a half miles down the arroyo, the nearest family is a bit worse off, as they are 300 feet lower in elevation and receive less snowfall to recharge the soil moisture in their fields. But if the rains come, they will do all right. And if the rains come, because they're 300 feet lower in elevation, they may have three or more or four more days frost-free in their growing season. So their cobs may come close to the full 70 calories. To meet each dietary need, each farmstead cultivates 3.95 acres, from which come nearly 60% of the annual calories in the form of corn, and possibly as much as 5 to 10% more of the annual calories from amaranth, goosefoot, and the side benefits of letting the turkeys pick through the garden plots for insects, drop corn, etc. The turkeys were too valuable for their eggs and feathers to make thermal bedrobes, to consume them in daily fare until they were old and barren. Annually, each family of 11 needed 7.8 million calories from all sources. What would any of us do if we were told, there's the landscape, here's your digging stick, go find a few million calories? <laughs> the world has changed quite a lot, has it not? Some other resources included beans and squash when grown and big game when available. Deer, pronghorn, desert bighorn, occasional bear, occasional elk. Question, the one I posed to my students. How then did these two families, and at most one to two hundred more, like them at 250 A.D., in the entire Four Corners district, become transformed into the Chakwan world of the 1000s AD with 200 great houses, hundreds of miles of road, and 20 to 30,000 farmsteads. In order to answer that, I want to go through three transitional periods and give you a portrait of the energetics and the kinds of adaptations that people were making. The periods are 250 to 400 A.D., which is formally classified as Basket Maker II, that is, pit house, society, a combination of farming and foraging, no pottery. Lots of baskets, hence Basket Maker. Or early Basket Maker III, which is basically the same style of society with a little more horticulture, a little more, and pottery, which transformed cooking. 650 A.D. to 800 A.D. is the next window that we looked at. That is Basket Maker III, that is the end of the period, the end of that adaptation, and Pueblo I, which is the first above-ground architecture, and more storerooms. And finally, 900 to 1050 A.D., which is Late Pueblo I, that is the end of the uh, below-ground houses, above-ground storage, and uh, early uh, P2 to middle P2, which is above-ground houses, above-ground storage, medium-sized villages. We pick transitional periods 
because we wanted that exoskeleton available to us. Okay, I'll go to the board here. 250 to 400 AD. This is our projection of minimum acreage in corn fields. There will be some squash and beans in some of the fields. There will be amaranth and goosefoot in many of the fields. 3.95 acres. 21,292 calories a day. 7.8 million calories a year. 650 to 800 A.D., 5.6 acres. 6.5 acres, 6.7 cobs of corn. Oh, excuse me, 16.7 cobs of corn for the 250 A.D. period. Now we're at 21.7 cobs per person per day. 5.6 acres. and 8.7 million calories a year per family. 900 to 1050, 25,312 calories a day. That's because of the work intensities going up as the field sizes increase. More labor, more calories. Six and a half acres under tillage. And for, and for five males and a couple of females, that's a lot. In colonial times, when you were awarded 10 acres and you had to work it in order to keep the patent, you were allowed to open up one acre a year. That is what a farmer, his wife, and a couple of kids could, without a, a mule and a plow, do. Some did a little bit better. But that even in the 1700s, patenting land on the eastern seaboard it was one acre a year. So it obviously took a while to develop each one of these farms to its full size. And 28 cobs a day. 16 cobs, 21.7 cobs, 28 cobs per person per day. Averaged over the whole 11 people. Obviously the adults ate more, the infants ate less. Let's look at some other details. From the data, from the data uh, from the San Juan Basin Project at SAR, we know that the number of pure Basket Maker II sites and transitional sites in that 400, 500 square mile area was 102. And we know from modeling of the population, and I'll tell you how we know shortly, Population growth in that 150-year period was 11 to 110 people, a tenfold increase. And so that means at the end of that 150-year period, the calories needed to support the direct descendants of one family had increased tenfold. This is a growth model. In the 650 to 800 A.D. period, still a family of 11, we readjust to keep everything standard. Higher work intensity, 23,922 calories per day, 8.7 million calories a year. Because the number of farmsteads is increasing, foraging areas are declining. And because of the isotope analysis of teeth, primarily, some long bones, but teeth primarily, we know that the consumption of C4 plants, that is domesticates, is rising. So we assign 70% of the total annual diet to corn. Now we have colleagues who assign higher levels. So we are being conservative by about 5 to 10% requires 5.6 acres of corn per family. This is with a digging stick and a stone 
or antler hoe. Think about this. Think about your backyard, your 20 tomato plants, the zucchini, a couple of peppers, and go 5.6 acres? You've got to be kidding. We live in easy times. That means the amount of acreage that a person required had gone up from one-third to one-half of an acre. And the amount of calories per acre that is produced on an average year has declined a bit because precipitation is lower in this period. In fact, the late 700s A.D. were very tough. So population increase during this time period is only 9.1 fold. You slow down a little. And each person's living descendants then required 9.1 times more calories than at the beginning of the period. In Pueblo times, 900 to 1050 were virtually all of the architecture is above ground. The family of 11 is at very high intensity of labor output, requires 25,312 calories per day, 9.24 million calories per year. Wild game and vegetals have decreased in the archaeological sites due to overhunting. We know this from analysis of the archaeological record. We assign 75% of the diet to corn, requiring almost 7 million corn calories per year, or 28 cobs per person per day. At average precipitation. This period shows that we now have 3,214 sites in the same district. 94 to 3,200, just a few hundred years apart. Bottom line, at every step of the way, daily requirements just to make a living set several trends into motion that were compellingly important. Everyone worked a little harder over the years, over the decades, over the centuries. Therefore, they required more calories. Therefore, the most valuable technological and behavioral innovations introduced efficiencies. Better hose, monos and matadis, the grinding stones with more surface for every sweep of the arm. Pots that were rounded and necked to reduce the loss of heat out the top of the pot. Firewood became scarcer. Pots became thinner. Corn started to be collect, uh, selected and selectively planted for larger cob and more cobs per plant. And sub-varieties of corn, specialized corn by the 8 and 900s AD, were used with shallow spreading racemes or roots for mesa top soils so that a wind or a hailstorm wouldn't uproot them and blow them off the mesa. But ones with very deep roots had been developed for planting in sand dunes where clay layers underneath caught surface moisture. The techniques of agriculture become more meticulous. And specifically, the storage facilities increase. In fact, just between 600 and 800 A.D., according to a number of studies, the amount of storage in each farmstead increased fourfold during those nasty late 700s A.D. periods. And this meant that people were trying to store in a good year enough to get through two or three years. 
of these behaviors, growth models are made. And of farming as an enterprise, the desire for more children and labor. Any of you raised on a farm know how this works. You're there, you are part of the workforce after you're 10 or 11 years old. Often you are doing small-scale work much earlier than that. Was then, and until just very recent times, has been the way it was. So farming pushes people into larger families. It nudges them that way. The, the, the 1800 USA average trans-Appalachian family was also 11 people. Infant mortality was high then. Infant mortality was high out here prehistorically. Every lost pregnancy was lost calories that had fueled that pregnancy. Lost. Nonetheless, substantial population increases took place. But there were two additional factors that people had to deal with throughout. We see them every year here in the Southwest. Patchy rainfall. It's raining on the mountain. It's not raining downtown. It's raining in the Hamas. It's dry as a bone where you're standing. That and year-to-year -year variation. So let me tell you the other story that has not been told. The earliest farms tended to be along the streams and arroyos and in marshes, cienegas, ojos. And flowing water or wet farming is much more reliable year to year, predictable, than dry farming, which is much more fragile and risky. But once those places were taken up by the 7 and 800s AD, the proportion of dry farming that actually fueled the beginning of the Chacoan system had risen to the point where there were greater and greater long-term statistical risks built into the farming enterprise over a wide region. Now, only 20% or 30% of farms, we're still trying to figure out the exact percentage, were wet farms as opposed to dry farms. So risks increased, and the two things that bedeviled people were patchy rainfall and variation year to year, forcing larger and larger storerooms. Well, the storerooms peaked in size at about 800 or so with the beginning of the P1 period, the above ground storage. And it is in the late 800s AD that the first large storerooms at Chaco Canyon are built at three early sites that had their roots in Pueblo I architecture, that is, underground rooms, uh, semi-circular storerooms above ground. They were Una Vida, Peñasco Blanco, y Pueblo Bonito. Those three P1 sites went on to steroids in the late 800s A.D. And what farmers needed the most at that time were more storerooms than they could fill to have access to. And at the same time, trade in pottery exploded. It had begun to increase rapidly during the 6 and 700s, and it just exploded in the 8 and 900s AD. And so what people are doing is creating a a big regional network where having other farms move surplus corn in districts that got rain into storehouses that are no longer owned by a single farmer. So what the Chacoan elites, those who became the Chacoan elites, offered were the same kinds of brokerage services the colonial barons in, in Providence, Rhode Island during the colonial period, like the Brown brothers and others offered. 
storerooms, production, transport, and eventually roads, which reduced transport costs by about 40%. So at 1050 A.D., everything in the Chakwan world is recognizable except the dynamics of how it got started. Step by step, one-tenth acre plot by one-tenth acre plot, one pregnancy by one pregnancy, magnified over seven centuries, tenfold increase, 250 to 400. Another 9.1-fold increase, 650 to 800. A 7.4-fold increase, 900 to 1050. Even as Chaco became the fabled size and shape that we all admire and look at the coffee table books, etc., it was already slowing down. And its infrastructure costs were now in a trajectory that said the minor portion of the expenditures of our calories is now invested in food and the major portion is invested in infrastructure, logistics, etc. Chaco was becoming expensive. We have become expensive. What Chaco needed was efficiencies. And on that note, the lesson we learn in modern America is that growth slows down. Read your statistical abstracts of the United States tonight or tomorrow or next week and look at what's happened to population growth in the last 150 years. We're slowing down. It requires a different set of adaptations than the growth adaptations. It requires efficiency. Next lecture, on October 10th, I'll give you the dynamics of the high period of Chaco and tell you why and how it came undone and what that has to do with daily behaviors in modern America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, David has agreed and I think is interested in answering questions. So, uh, Carol, would you come up here a minute? Pl oh, there you are. Great. Um, back up. Uh, so, we don't have a microphone, so we have three sets of ears here to try to answer your questions. Any questions? Yes. How the Chaco elite uh, got people to agree to store the surplus. Yes. Is that what you said? Yes. What they provided in the early 10 hundreds and the late 9 hundreds was transport and logistic efficiencies with these big storerooms. People could get seed Any clean, questions are in Chinese. Could get emergency rations. These are mine. As German. they reached the end of the rope, they were no longer able to provide that so reliably. Uh, just think recent hurricanes, U.S., um, harder to get a return when things get a little brittle. So Chaco and elites did their job early on, but couldn't solve the scalar problem of the continued growth. Another question. Yes. Work intensity. These are work. Why, yeah, why, why did the work intensify? Why, why, why was that? Uh, because they're farming more. They're bigger acreage. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. More. Yeah. So 
my, my rough estimate, not ready for publication, is that we start this sequence with about 800 hours a year of work at 250 AD, and we get into the Chalkwin period where it's 2,500 hours. Was it part of it possibly because they were building these huge... Uh, well, that's, that, that's not at the individual family level. That's, that comes in the next lecture. The answer is, yeah, there were jillions of calories that went into the big structure. Any other questions? Yes. How did they transport the corn? The question was, how did they transport the corn? Corn on foot. The question. <laughs> In baskets. And um, that's why the Chocolate Roads were so important. Uh, some years ago, there were respirometer studies done of walking across unmodified desert floor along the edges of the Great North Road out of Chaco, as opposed to in the unrepaired roadbed that hadn't been repaired in a thousand years. The, the savings in calories measured by the respirometer as, as athletic work showed that there were, even after that many years, there was a 38% savings in the caloric cost to go from point A to point B by walking in the old roadbed. It was probably once 50%. Yes. So many baskets, what were they made of? What were the baskets made of? Uh, often, uh, often willow, sometimes yucca, but willow was a favorite. There are a, a number of things, and I'm not an expert on baskets per se. <laughs> I'm the calorie freak. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, since Mesoamerica must have had a, a much larger population. Did they have more efficient farming methods? They did. The Chinampa stuff on the floating uh, gardens uh, in Mexico Dave, was spectacular. Would you repeat that question for the people in the back, please? Yes. Uh, in Mesoamerica, did they have more efficient farming practices? Yes, in areas. The floating gardens in and around uh, lakes in central Mexico were extraordinarily efficient. They got three to four crops a year and endless water supply, and, and so on and so forth. The, what we call the floating gardens. Yeah, it was spectacular. Yes, they in also the back. relied a lot on small grass seeds. In yeah. the back. From what you said so far, we would infer that this was a rather peaceful society. It, wa it was right up to till the last 20 years or so. Was this a peaceful society? No, there's no, war, no warrior groups, um, militarization, none of that in evidence until late Chaco and Great Houses, 1090 to 1125 AD. Yes. How large was a cob of corn? How large is a cob of corn used by these people? About 25 to 30 percent had a slightly higher nutritional value than contemporary corn. It's been, uh, uh, you know, a lot of modern food has been so modified for size that its uh, nutritional content's a little lower than it once was. So heirloom varieties, you, you can't just, size doesn't tell you the exact ratio of one to the others. The book to read is called Histories of Maize. We used our corn estimates from 27 varieties of prehistoric corn. Um, I didn't bring all the methodological notes tonight, but just the material that I gave you tonight. There's 16 pages, single line, single spaced of methodological um, detail. Yeah. I'm looking at your data here, and on four acres, uh, it appears that there's 7.8 million, uh, about to say 8 million. Okay, good. I couldn't hear that. No. So your question is, at what period? 250 to 400 AD is 21,292. 650 is 23,922 a day. 900 to 1050 is 25,312. That's just 365 times that. The 7.8 million, the 8.7, the 9.2. Thank you. 
Uh, the, yes. comment, the comment, A plus, come to class next year. <laughs> and everyone here, the efficiency is going down, the gentleman. And I said. will be teaching a class at SAR this spring um, on the archaeology of New Mexico. No college credit, but it'll be a class. <laughs>